Welcome to this video on pressure volume loops. So in this video, we're gonna put together some of the concepts that we've already talked about. We'll talk about some basic principles first on how to read these pressure volume loops. We'll go through uh, different phases of the cardiac cycle. We'll go back to uh, preload contractility, afterload, just see how they affect these loops. And then we'll look at some very specific uh, pathologies. This is one of those topics that I would say has become more and more prevalent over time. And so um, it's definitely one of the uh, higher yield topics for cardiac physiology. So just to understand things a little bit, let's start off with the basics and we'll work our way up. So this is the loop that we're talking about. And in, and in this particular diagram, they don't have the um, X and Y axis labeled. So let's label that here. So again, these are pressure volume loops. So we have our left ventricular pressure. And by the way, we're primarily just going to be looking at the left ventricle when we're looking at these pressure volume loops. Okay, very rarely will you see, you know, any other chamber tested. So it's usually almost always going to be left ventricle. So left ventricular pressure, and then we have our left ventricular volume here on the x axis. Okay, so let's just start at this point right here. So at this point, the mitral valve is going to open, and we're going to get blood filling from the left atrium into the left ventricle. Okay, and so that's what this represents. This line here is representing filling because remember, the x-axis is primarily going to be volume. And so we're increasing the volume going into the left ventricle. Okay, so we're starting with some lower volume here and we're ending with some higher volume here. Okay, and this volume that we end with eventually uh, will have the mitral valve closing at this point. Okay, so the mitral valve opens, we fill, the mitral valve closes. When the mitral valve closes, it makes a particular sound. That's gonna be the S1 hard sound. And this phase is known as the ventricular filling phase. Okay, because that's essentially what's happening here. The ventricle is just filling with blood. And then after this phase, the mitral valve is gonna close. It's gonna make the S1 hard sound, and we're gonna get isovolumetric contraction. Okay, so the ventricle is going to be contracting here. And eventually, when the left ventricular pressure exceeds the aortic pressure, the aortic valve is gonna open. So it's important to note this is isovolumetric. Look, there's no change in the volume. Normally this phase will have a very vertical, you know, straight line because there's no change in the volume. All the valves are closed and there's a contraction happening, but we can't change the volume so the pressure shoots up. When the pressure shoots up above the aortic pressure, the aortic valve opens. Okay, so that's the second phase here. And then the next phase we have here is going to be the ejection phase. I'm just gonna put ejection here and we're gonna talk about these phases a lot more when we do the cardiac cycle video. But just to give you an idea, so initially what happens is we kind of have this slower rise in pressure initially until we end up reaching a peak pressure right about here. And this peak pressure is sometimes referred to as the peak systolic pressure, okay? So it's basically the highest systolic pressure that, that um, we're gonna end up reaching. And what's a little slightly confusing about this curve is that we actually are going to see a decrease uh, still in this phase in the overall pressure. So the pressure kind of goes up, 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 up while we're having the ventricles contract with the aortic valve open, right? We're moving the blood out of the ventricle. That's why the volume is decreasing. That volume of blood is going to the aorta. As that volume decreases, our contraction will eventually go through relaxation and the pressure will start to drop. Now it's around this point actually, when this pressure starts to drop, that the aortic valve closes. Okay, so I don't want you to get confused by this black dot here. It's actually somewhere around here that the aortic valve is gonna close. So we're gonna get some relaxation. When the left ventricular pressure is lower than the aortic valve pressure, that's when that valve kind of slams shut behind. Okay, and so that's when the aortic valve closes. And what sound does this make? This is gonna be the S2 heart sound, right? So you can see S1 heart sound is here. That's the mitral valve. S2 is gonna be your aortic valve up here. And then after that valve closes, again, now all the valves are closed. So we enter another isovolumetric phase. Okay, so here's another isovolumetric phase. In other words, the volume's not changing. That's why we have a straight vertical line. We just have a, cha a change in pressure. With all of the valves closed, the ventricles can relax, and we get this rapid descent in the pressure that eventually gets us so low in pressure that the left atrial pressure will exceed the left ventricular pressure opening the mitral valve, starting the whole process again. So a couple of the key principles here. So all valves are closed during isovolumetric phases. Okay, normally that's what we would expect to happen. That's why we get straight lines. Now, if we didn't have all the valves closed, if we had a regurgitation or a leaky valve, so to speak, we wouldn't necessarily have straight lines, right? Because we'd have 
blood that's backflowing through that valve. And so it's actually going to change the volume. It won't be completely isovolumetric. Normally, physiologically, though, that's what we would see. Now, the thing that I want to call your attention to is let's look at our volumes for a second. We already said stroke volume, right? The amount of blood, the forward stroke volume, the amount of blood ejected from the heart is going to be equal to the end diastolic volume minus the end systolic volume, right? We said that earlier. That's the amount of blood that's ejected. The end diastolic volume, right? We go through ventricular filling, we fill the ventricle with blood, and then we end with a volume before we undergo contraction. So this furthest rightward point, that's the end diastolic volume. Okay, you can even say that this line represents the end diastolic volume. The only trick with that is if you have a regurgitating valve or a leaky valve, this line might not be straight. It might look something like that. And so this point then is usually the best indicator for the end diastolic volume. So that's the volume before we contract. It's the volume at the end of diastole, right? And then the end systolic volume, it would be this point right over here. So the point when the aortic valve closes, that would be the end systolic volume. And again, kind of the same concept. Can you say that this whole line is the end systolic volume? Yeah, in this, in this particular diagram, you could. But if these lines were on an angle from some pathology, you would want to specifically pick the point at which the aortic valve closes as your end systolic volume. And so the idea here is that we have an end diastolic volume and an end systolic volume, right? So the distance between these two volumes, right? The distance between these two, that's going to make up the stroke volume. Okay, that's the amount of blood that was ejected during the ejection phase through the aorta. Okay, that's the stroke volume. So the width of the pressure volume loop will tell you the stroke volume. Okay, now what about the area? What if we took the area of this pressure volume loop? That will tell us the stroke work. Okay, so remember, more stroke work requires more myocardial oxygen consumption more myocardial demand. Okay, so keep that in mind. And then the last part is the base of this actually makes up the ventricular compliance. So here, let me do this in another color. This line here on the bottom that I'm highlighting in yellow, usually that baseline will tell you the ventricular compliance. So remember, if you have a higher compliance, right? If, you're, if your veins, for example, have a higher compliance, they're able to store more blood, they're able to change their volume at a given pressure much e more easily. Same thing with the ventricle. If the ventricle has a high compliance, it can accommodate more ventricular filling. Over time, let's just say that I have aortic stenosis, or I have chronic hypertension, or I have aortic coarctation, right? Or I have something that's basically preventing the blood from leaving the left ventricle. So I have some stenosis that the blood has to get through that's increasing the afterload proximal to it. Okay, in those situations, what ends up happening is you get ventricular remodeling and you end up developing ventricular hypertrophy, but that comes at a cost, okay? So if you develop ventricular hypertrophy, your compliance actually starts to go down. Okay, and so what happens is these curves for patients that have really low ventricular compliance or have high ventricular hypertrophy, this baseline is actually going to get moved up. The bottom of this pressure volume curve is going to get moved up with a lower compliance. So let's take this information now and let's add on the preload and the afterload and the contractility and all those things that we talked about. And let's see how those affect this curve.